Welcome back to the series that causes people to ask me what happened to your hand. So today we are going to find out how long ink takes to get off the forearm, I mean, the forearm anatomy, or the anatomy of the antibrachial region. Now, can you easily identify the major muscles here on my forearm? No, of course not, neither can I. Since I'm not a professional bodybuilder, it would be pretty hard to see the muscles with my forearm relaxed. So I've brought enough weights here to achieve an isometric contraction. That is, I don't actually mean to lift the wave. I just mean to keep a constant amount of strength pushing upwards, which should keep my muscles contract and make it easier to locate each of them. Since we'll be using a real arm here, we'll be going from the most conspicuous structures, the easiest muscles to see, to the hardest ones. Rather than going from medial to lateral exactly, for example. And by the way, when talking anatomy, please make sure you think medial and lateral, rather than just right and left. For example, here I'll be using my left forearm, since I'm right-handed. But I've always referred to these structures as the medial structure, or the inward structures, and the lateral structures, or the structures on the external side. Because if you think of structures as the one on the right, or the one on the left, when you switch forearms from the left one to the right one, we will be thoroughly confused. So it's easier to remember what's on the inside and what's on the outside of the body, what's medial and what's lateral, rather than thinking about left or right. Okay, so starting from an anatomical view and looking at the anterior portion of the forearm, the first thing you notice probably is that there are kind of like two large bulges. One that's more medial and one that's more lateral. And they are actually surrounding a depressed region, which is the cubital fossa. So you have the lower, the deeper cubital fossa. And on its lateral side, you have the larger mass, which is the brachioradialis muscle. And on the medial side, you have a smaller mass, which are flexors, but the border of the cubital fossa is actually drawn by the pronator teres muscle. And this is why I brought the weights. So, the brachioradialis muscle flexes the forearm at the elbow. So, if I try here to flex my forearm at the elbow, against this weight, particularly if my arm is somewhat prone, you will see a large mass becomes delineated here on the lateral portion of my forearm. This is the brachioradialis muscle trying to flex my forearm. You can see it originates right here, slightly superior to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, that is, on the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, and it inserts here, distally, at the styloid process of the radius. It's innervated by the radial nerve, because it's in the posterior compartment, even though it's a flexor. On the other side of the cubital fossa, however, we have the pronator teres muscle, whose main function as the name suggests, will be to pronate the forearm. So, if I try to pronate my forearm against the weight, you will see here that you can start to see a somewhat thin band stretching from its origin in the humerus and the ulna towards its insertion in the middle of the lateral surface of the radius. So you can see that it's trying to pull the radius inwards so as to make it go over the ulna. It's not hard to imagine its function precisely because it has a somewhat more oblique trajectory than the other muscles. It's not just going from proximal to distal. 
it's also going from medial to lateral. And together with the pronator teres, this more medial bulge here corresponds to the flexors, essentially inserting in the medial epicondyle of the humerus, you will have on this first most superficial layer, first the flexor carpa radialis, right after the pronator teres, and then going more medially, the palmaris longus, and then the flexor carpi ulnaris. Makes complete sense. The radius is more lateral and the ulna is more medial. So the flexor carpi radialis is more lateral and the flexor carpi ulnaris is more medial. And the palmaris longus is just between the two of them. So if I were to tell you that all the wrist and digiti flexors are innervated by the medial nerve, except one. And I'm not talking here about the brachioradialis. No, the brachioradialis is a flexor of the elbow. We're talking about flexors of the wrist and digiti. So they are all innervated by the medial nerve, except one. Which muscle would you say is innervated by the ulnar nerve? Perhaps the flexor carpi Ulnaris, the only one that has owner in the name? Absolutely, they are pretty close by. It makes sense that the owner nerve would innervate exactly the closest muscle to it. And of course, all the flexors flex. But wouldn't you agree that origin matters? Where are you pulling towards? So, if you pull with the flexor carpi radialis, you are going to pull not only towards the elbow, but also towards the radius. So it's going to cause flexion with radial deviation. And meanwhile, if you're going to pull with the flexor carpi ulnaris, you're going to pull towards the ulna or medially. So we're going to flex with ulnar deviation. And if you flex both of them, you are not going to deviate. So, why do you even need a third muscle, the palmaris longus? Well, maybe you don't, because 15% of the population don't have it. And now we know what constitutes the superficial compartment of the flexors of the wrist and digiti. Which is why I've redrawn my forearm here, and now you can see I've removed the superficial compartment. So, if this pen was a scalpel, you will now see the intermediate compartment. And so when talking about flexors, the deeper the muscles, the more distal the effects. So the muscles we've already talked about in the superficial compartment mostly just flex the wrist. So if we want to flex the metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints, we have to go deeper. And here in the intermediate compartment is where we're going to find the flexor digitorum superficialis, because there is one that's deeper to it. Where does it originate from? Well, where do flexors originate from? The medial epicondyle of the humerus. What else? Also, in this case, the radius. How is it innervated? How are the flexors innervated? The medial nerve. And where does it insert? Well, test makers love this because it inserts in the middle phalanges. But just before inserting, it splits into two, thus allowing the deeper muscle, the flexor digitorum profundus, to go through it and insert in the distal phalanges. Now, people may think it's unique, beautiful, poetic, but in the end, the deeper, the more distal. G, G, deeper, distal. The flexor digitorum superficialis is going to insert into the middle phalanges. The flexor digitorum profundus, profundus, deep, is going to insert into the distal phalanges. And since this is the only muscle in the intermediate compartment, now we've discussed the flexor digitorum superficialis, we can go to the deep compartment where we will find the last three muscles. 
starting with the flexor pollicis longus. The flexor digitorum muscles, both the superficialis and the profundus, flex fingers 2 through 4. So we need another flexor for the thumb. And here it is, the flexor of the thumb, the flexor pollicis longus. Since it's going to flex the thumb, it's going to insert in the distal phalanx of the thumb. It originates from the anterior surface of the radius and the interosseous member nearby. It's a bit shorter than the other muscles, which makes sense because the thumb is shorter than the other fingers. And how is it innervated? Well, how are flexors generally innervated? The median nerve. And then for the other fingers, two through four, since the flexor digitorum superficialis inserted into the middle phalanges, if we want to flex the distal interphalangeal joints, we will need some muscle to insert into the distal phalanges, and that muscle is the flexor digitorum profundus. It originates from the ulna and the nearby interosseous membrane, and of course, all these tendons are going through the carpal tunnel. How is it innervated? Well, how are flexors generally innervated? The median nerve. Except that there is not just a single exception to this rule. There is the flexor carpi ulnaris, which is innervated by the ulnar nerve, and there is also the flexor digitorum profundus, which has the medial half innervated by the ulnar nerve and the lateral half innervated by a branch of the median nerve, the anterior interosseous branch. How am I supposed to remember this? Uh, well, I don't know. Just think that maybe it's so deep that the median nerve had trouble completely innervating it and so it was also necessary to call in another nerve. Whatever helps you. And finally, we have the pronator quadratus, which originates from the ulna and attaches to the radius. So, as we saw with the pronator teres, if it has pronator in the name, it's most likely going to pronate the forearm. And as with basically all other flexors, it's innervated by the median nerve. And also because it's a pronator, we can guess it's going to be a bit more oblique rather than simply going from proximal to distal, which means that basically for pronate in the arm, we have two muscles in the same compartment of the flexors, a round one, kind of, pronator teres, teres means round, and a square one, square-like, the quadratus, pronator quadratus, quadratus means square. So we have the flexor carpi ulnaris, the flexor carpi radialis, and the palmaris longus in the superficial compartment, the flexor digitorum superficialis in the intermediate compartment, and the flexor digitorum profundus, the flexor pollicis longus, and the pronator quadratus in the deep compartment. And with this, we conclude the anterior view of the forearm. Thank you for your attention and for choosing to share your time with me. I hope this video has been useful and if you've liked it, please consider checking my other videos or subscribing for when I release videos on the posterior view of the forearm as well as other structures than not just muscles. Thank you again for your time and I hope to see you on the next video.